Konnichiwa, Minasan. Hello, everyone. Hola. Bonjour. Guten Tag. Ni hao. So many different ways to say so many of the same things in so many languages. Today, though, we're going to focus on English, and most importantly, conversational English. So, some of the most important things to know in conversational English are vocabulary and synonyms. So, vocabulary is very uh, often taught in elementary schools, very basic information. So, you learn words and their meanings. And one of the most important resources in that is to get yourself a dictionary. I have here the Webster's New World Dictionary, but there are several other dictionaries you can use. There are many from Oxford or Webster's has alternative dictionaries. Uh, I actually might have even, I actually do have more dictionaries over here on my bookshelf, but I digress. This is going to be a very helpful research tool for expanding your vocabulary, right? So you can look up any word you need to in here. If you find it in a book or you hear it in a song or a movie or something like that, you can look up any of those words in here. Uh, if you have an issue sounding out the word to write it out, well, that can pose its own difficulty. So sometimes you've got to really research to find the book you're looking or the word you're looking for in the dictionary. Another book that will help you out, and this is where we talk about synonyms, the book that will help you out with synonyms, I almost made the most common mistake, a lot of people mispronounce the word synonym as the spice cinnamon. Uh, the one of the most important research tools to help find synonyms of different words that you find in the dictionary is going to be a thesaurus. A thesaurus gives you alternative words to use in place of a given word. So you see, instead of, let's say, middle, you could say halfway, central, or intermediate, right? <clears throat> Whereas this book tells me what the word middle means, this word gives me alternative words to use instead of middle. All right. So vocabulary is going to be a very important thing in helping you to understand English and synonyms are very important in helping you to expand your English vocabulary, right? Now, for conversational English, the best way to start is learning how to refer to yourself, which is getting your eyes, me's, and my's sorted out, right? So, I means I am the one taking action in the sentence. So, I go to school, right? I took the action of going to school in that sentence. Whereas me, I am the subject of an action at that point. So, he takes me to school. In this sentence, I'm not the one doing the action. I'm the one having the action done to me. So he is taking me and he's taking me where? To school, right? Whereas my is just reference of ownership. So my board, right? That's just a reference of ownership. That can be a sentence in its own if it's a reply to a question, but it's not much of a sentence if you're just saying, my board. So, and at any point in time, if uh, you want to 
save any information that I've written on the board, please just take a screenshot and feel free to use it as you need. Now, next, for referring to others, to be more formal and more polite, the best way to refer to others is with the equivalent in English to honorifics in Japanese, let's say. So you have like san, chan, tan, stuff like that in Japanese. Well, in English, we have Mr. Mrs. and Miss. Now, Miss, it is often written incorrectly in many mediums as that, but in all technicality and being very proper, I'm sure there's I'm I'm sure there's a difference that somebody can point out, and I would be glad to be having the difference pointed out in the comment section or maybe post it on Twitter and explain it to me. But oftentimes, while this is different, it is not the same as this. This is often misused to be equivalent to this. So, Mr., Mrs., and Miss. Mr. is in reference to any male. Any male figure is going to be Mr. So always male. Mrs. is a married female. And Miss is an unmarried female. So, uh, in Japan, you'll often use, like, kun as a honorific towards a male character or male individual that you're talking to, right? And sometimes you can use san as well. In English, mister would be basically the equivalent to, like, referring to them as kun or... Obviously, if they're a person of much higher status and, or for some reason you have a higher level of respect for them, you might even refer to them as Sama in Japanese. But English, it's very simple. It's just any male gets Mr. Any married female gets Mrs. And any unmarried female gets Miss. All right. So once again, if you need to, take a screenshot of that. And we're moving on to the next thing. Right. So, in English, whenever you're talking to someone, contrary to Japanese, where you introduce yourself with a family name, then a given name, in English, your given name is more important than your family name. So, in English, John is the given name, Smith is the family name. In English, we call them first and last names. And most often, you will refer to someone by the first name. But some people prefer to be referred to uh, by their last name. Like in the military, the they would prefer to go by their last name. Or they just do go by their last name because everybody else calls them by their last name, so they don't bother. And then you, when you're being more respectful, will not have the first name. And it will just be Mr. Smith. Right? So if you're working for like a CEO named John Smith or your manager is named John Smith and you're trying to be more formal with them, then you'd probably just call them Mr. Smith rather than John or John Smith or anything like that. 
it would probably just be, hello, Mr. Smith. So there's that, right? If you don't know someone's name and you want to still talk to them or you are talking in a more formal setting and you need to refer to them respectfully, then usually we have sir and ma'am. to refer to someone respectfully. And these will be usually thrown in either at the beginning or the end of the sentence, sometimes in the middle, but usually at the beginning of the end. So when you're trying to get someone's attention, you can say, uh, sir, excuse me, can you help me? Or ma'am, excuse me, but can you point me in the right direction? Right? So, these are respectful ways to refer to someone that help you to get around, right? If you're lost in this, you know, if you're lost at a, uh, at an airport or you maybe don't know where you're going in town and find someone that is safe to approach, you can always just say, excuse me, sir, or excuse me, ma'am, can you help me find where I need to be? And so long as they're local and know where you're, what location you are talking about, and so long as you're in the right area to actually get that information, then they can help you out, right? But sir and ma'am are very respectful ways to refer to men and women that you either don't know or you do know, but you need to be more respectful when you're talking to them. Sir and ma'am are going to help you out in, immensely, right? Now, when it comes to greetings, right, the English-speaking natives, we have all sorts of greetings. It depends on who you are, how long you've known that person. There's just so many things that go into a greeting. Uh, the circumstances behind the meeting that you are having. So... It's, it's very difficult to say with certainty, hey, this is the greeting you should be using as your standard when you encounter this situation. But the more formal greetings would be greetings of the time of day. So, good morning. Oops. So good morning or good afternoon or good evening. Now, there is a fourth time of day other than morning, afternoon, and evening, right? But good night which is the fourth time of day, night is not used as a greeting. It is used as a farewell, right? You're not using good night in terms of, you know, running into someone in the middle of the night. Let's say you're out walking around after you just got done with a party at a bar or a club or something like that, right? And now you're walking through downtown to get to your favorite restaurant that's open 24 hours. You run into someone at 2 o'clock in the morning. Well, technically, it's what most people would consider the middle of the night. But you don't say goodnight as a greeting if you encounter someone because goodnight means you're going to bed. So goodnight is a farewell, whereas all three of these are a more formal way to say hello. So, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. All formal ways of saying hello. And it really depends on the time of day, which one you use. All right? So, these are all, I'll put it up here so you guys can take a screenshot if you want. 
but we'll call these the formal greetings. Now, obviously, when I say formal greetings, I mean they're more for individuals that you might not be familiar with. If you use good morning, good afternoon, good evening, you'll usually get a better response from someone you don't know if you say something more formal such as this. But this is obviously not like you're not going to use this in circumstances such as going to a formal event like a major, you know, black tie event at a golf club or something like that. And you were invited as a plus one and you don't know anybody there. There's probably going to be some decorum that you'll have to learn specific to that circumstance. But in most cases, if you don't know somebody and you want to have a good greeting with them, then good morning, good afternoon, and good evening is a good way to give some air of formality and not have to worry about, let's say, giving that, you know, them being a little awkward with you when you try to be more, you know, more friendly. So these are the formal, let's say formal greetings. And I'll put formal in quotation marks to indicate that it's not actually about the formality. It's just about the uh, impersonality of the greeting, let's say. Right? So, like I said, hope you're taking screenshots of anything you might need. And let's move on. So, now let's work on personal or informal greeting. Now, this will not be a definitive list for the reasons I stated earlier, which are there are just so many ways that people say things depending on who you are, who you are to them, um, like the relationships and stuff like that, how long you've known that person, how well you know that person. Everybody has different greetings when they have someone that they're personally close with or familiar with, right? <clears throat> so, very commonly, hello, hi. And while the next two may not necessarily be greetings, they're often used instead of saying hello or hi to start your greeting with them. Uh, you'll often see, oh, and uh, hey. But hey can also be just an attention getter too. So like instead of, I wouldn't necessarily think of hey as a greeting so much as you are calling out to someone so you'll often see in circumstances uh hey so you'll often see somebody maybe walking down the sidewalk they have something fall out of their pocket right and the person that was walking behind them notices picks it up and they'll say hey you know hey mister hey sir you dropped this out of your pocket Right. So, hey is more of an attention getter. And while it is a greeting of sorts, it's more about, like, making a loud noise that gets somebody's attention. Like I said, an attention getter. So, hey is more of an attention getter than it is a greeting, but it could also be considered a greeting. All right. So, as I was saying, the next two aren't necessarily what many would classify as a greeting. But they are very prevalent when it comes to when it comes to English speakers. So how are you? And a lot of these are also responses to greetings, but sometimes they are the first thing somebody says. So technically a greeting. So you run into a friend you haven't seen in a long time and Rather than saying, you know, oh, hey, Mike, how you been? You say, you just start up the conversation with, how are you? 
And what's up is a very common, especially between people that know each other, very common, um, very common greeting in the United States. You know, you'll hear somebody say, oh, what's up, man? Something along those lines. You'll very often see that. And it is a conversation starter as well as a greeting. That's another reason why these are used often as greetings. Because they aren't just greetings. They are also conversation starters. So it's less so about properly greeting someone and more so about actually garnering an interaction. So I could just walk down the street and say to anybody, you know, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, hello, hello, how are you? Like, yeah, the how are you doesn't always garner a response. So, you know, this doesn't always start a conversation, but the good evenings, good afternoons, good, uh, good mornings, hellos, highs, stuff like that. Just plain greetings will not start a conversation. So oftentimes you'll see people use how are you and what's up when they're trying to start a conversation with you. So that's the circumstances that you'll see those, right? Again, hope you're taking screenshots for any time that I move on and you might want maybe to save the resources that I've written on the board, right? So, now that we've gone over some basic conversation starters, uh, we can go ahead and we can start talking about maybe proper ways to respond. So, how are you? There are a lot of ways to answer, how are you? But, you know, you could say good, you could say lovely weather, you could say anything, you know? So long as it seems like an appropriate answer to the question, you can answer how are you in any way you want to, right? But how are you is just a foot in the door for a conversation. You're just trying to get the conversation started, right? Same thing with what's up. Now, when it comes to English speakers, native English speakers, they can be a little difficult to understand sometimes because of how many different ways that they can pronounce words and also how much slang we use. So slang exists in every language in the world. And it is short and language. Shorthand language. That's slang, right? And so the slang is going to be used for instead of saying one thing that is a really long, you know, you say, instead of saying a whole sentence, you can just say a couple things. A uh, lot of people are familiar with text talk, right? So text talk, we see abbreviations like LOL is actually laugh out loud. Slang is the same thing as text language, just in real life. In real applications of the language, you get slang, whereas in text form, you'll have, well, text talk. And while text talk came about because of restrictions on the number of characters that people could use to send a message with originally with cell phones, um, slang just comes about because people, rather than saying, you know, something along the lines of in Japanese, right? So slang in Japanese. Instead of saying konnichiwa or konbanwa or ohayo gozaimasu, 
a lot of times you'll have people saying cheats right you got like what's up being said basically instead of having to do this whole oh good morning good evening good you know afternoon instead of that they'll just say oh what's up now that isn't a good example of slang that's a better example of substituting something else out but slang is just like i said it's just shorthand you're just trying to simplify the language down all right so i think for the next roughly half an hour that we have left i think i can start giving you examples of things for you to practice speaking english and just listen to yourself maybe pull out your cell phone right uh if you're not using your cell phone to watch this video then pull out your cell phone record yourself but let's say i go ahead and i start giving you basic sentences and basic interactions and then you can copy that and focus on pronunciation of words right so i did go over some basic concepts and basic things like that in english that maybe are a little bit more formal education type of things but that was so i give you the building blocks to speaking english casually and comfortably because it's also about comfort and if you if it's too uncomfortable to speak the language then you're not going to want to speak the language that's that's just how it is people don't want to do things that make them uncomfortable so let's go over maybe some greetings and stuff like that right so maybe i now am going to use myself as an example here right so uh let's say i'm working at the airport you just landed in in the united states i'm just a security guard casually let's say reading a book and keeping an eye out for anybody doing anything inappropriate or people bringing me contraband that they maybe find a discarded bag or something like that somewhere so you can approach me while i'm reading and say excuse me sir yes how can i get to baggage claim right so now you try say excuse me sir how can i get to baggage claim and sometimes you don't even need to put the pause in there for a response. If you get a response, obviously, be polite and pause for the response to the excuse me, sir. So if you say excuse me, sir, a lot of times you just garnered their attention. It's It got their attention. You're not really going to get a response in every situation with that one. But you will have gotten their attention because probably they know that you're needing assistance with something so you say oh excuse me sir they get their attention they put their book down and you say can you point me in the direction of baggage claim or can you tell me how to get to baggage claim because obviously you're going to have your luggage and you need to go collect your things in order to enjoy your trip here in the united states right or enjoy your stay if you're planning on coming over permanently and at that point in time so long as he's not rude or for some reason in a poor mood the security officer or individual that you spoke to will say oh sure you go that way and etc 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 and point you in those directions right now <clears throat> let's say someone took 
your bag from the turnstile and you notice that it's your bag. Now you can say, excuse me, I think that is my bag. Now, we say, I think, rather than, that's my bag, or making that claim. Because if you just start with, excuse me, that's my bag, rather, it gives off a poor vibe. It gives off a, it gives off a negative attitude. It seems accusatory. So instead of coming off as you say, you know, saying, honest mistake, you grab the wrong bag. Your, if you say, excuse me, that's my bag, or anything akin to that, they will hear it and think you're accusing them of theft. And even if they are a thief, the best way to approach that is not making the accusation directly because then it could lead to a confrontation and we don't want confrontation, right? So instead of saying outright, excuse me, that's my bag, you say, excuse me, I think you took my bag by mistake. You could always throw the by mistake bag on the end of it, just even further, you know, diffuse and distract from the fact that you're not trying to accuse them, you're trying to make it clear that you think it was an honest mistake, right? So you could say, I think you took my bag by mistake. And there you go. Now you've diffused the situation because you have made it clear you, that you're not accusing them of stealing intentionally. You're not accusing them of stealing. And stealing, it, the act of stealing is an intentional act anyway. So you're, by saying, I think you took my bag by mistake, now you're not accusing them of stealing. You're just saying, hey, um, that's my bag. I think we made a mistake here. And also, the other thing that will help with that is the fact that they will probably be looking for their things on the turnstile now because they're probably going to be concerned that if they took your things, well, now somebody else might take theirs. So very easy way to deal with a negative circumstance, right? So now you've got your luggage from the turnstile, and now you can go wherever you need to go to either rent a car if you have a license and you can drive, or you can go to, let's say, get a taxi. You'll obviously have a location or destination in mind if you have a taxi, though. So then all you need to do is tell the taxi driver where you want to go. However, be aware, just as any other taxi and anywhere else in the world. Um, try not to take it for long distance rides because that's expensive. Uh, so you, let's go over some basic, like basic conversational English with circumstances that you might encounter every day, right? So you run into an American student in the middle of Tokyo, right? This American student, you're sitting there and you want to practice your English, right? So you see your opportunity. You want to practice English. Here you go. Say, hello. And if you, if that gets their attention, very well. If it doesn't, don't feel bad. Try again. Now, let's say it gets their attention. You could say, how are you today? And once again, please feel free to pause the video after I say a sentence, right? And say it out loud yourself. And then you could also rewind the video, listen to me say it again, and practice saying it yourself. So, hello, how are you? I am fine, thanks. What brings you to Tokyo? Ah, I see. 
Are you having a good time? Have you enjoyed the food? Is it easy for you to handle the trains? All of these are basic conversation starters and help build momentum to continue the conversation. So you could then say, what country are you from? What, so you're from America, then what state are you from? What is it like where you come from? All of these are basic conversation, uh, conversation starters that can lead you down into having a deeper conversation with that individual. So, let's say I am now the American and you approach me. Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm fine. Thanks. Are you enjoying your stay in Tokyo? Yes, I am. Very much. What do you enjoy most about Tokyo? I enjoy how nice the people are. Hmm. Where are you from? I am from America. Oh, really? What state are you from? I am from Maine. Ah, what is it like in Maine? It is cold in the wintertime, but nice the rest of the year. There's a lot of fishing on the coast. See, now we have basic two sides of that conversation all wrapped up into one. And please, like I said, at any point in time, feel free to pause the video and mimic what I said, right? And just do your own practice, compare with how it sounds when I say it versus when you say it. And these are just basic conversations to help you when you interact with an American, right? Or any other native English speaker. So, now I am reading a book. That's what I am doing now. I am writing well that's what that is as I am writing right and just basically getting the hang of speaking English so you just follow along say I am writing or when you talk about somebody else then you say he or she is writing. So when you're talking about me doing the writing, instead of I am writing, you say he is writing. When I say I am reading a book, you say he is reading a book. Right? Very, very simple. So now let's talk about when you have situations where, for whatever reason, and hopefully you don't need to use it, but let's talk about situations where maybe you're not, uh, you're in a bad spot. You need, you need to get out of the situation that you're in, right? So, in Japanese, they say, taskete, 
right? In English, it is help me or please help me. I hope that you don't need to ask for help for any reason when you're in your stay in the United States. And please avoid the dangerous areas of the cities and places that you go. Please be, you know, traveling in groups with multiple people or have a very trusted friend in the United States that you can be sure will take you places and keep you safe and help you get out of situations that may be negative. Um, but if you do need help and let's say maybe the person that's in front of you might not be the person you're asking for help. You don't see anybody around. Just say, you know, as loud as possible, help me, please help me, something like that. But do call for help and hopefully someone will come. But the be the most important thing is to know how to say help me and also identify, you know, identify what's going on when someone does come to help you. So please, you know, say help me, please. When they come to help you, let's say you go to a national park, right? And you go ahead and accidentally slip off the trail. Start, you know, if you can't stand up for whatever reason or something like that, or your injury, you know, might be bad, just say at the top of your lungs, please help me. Yell it as loud as you can manage. Say, please help me. Somebody please help me. And then when somebody comes, explain to them, you know, I fell off the trail and now let's say my leg is broken. I, I think my leg is broken. Please help me. Right? So. In a situation where you're maybe not in danger, but you do still need help, let's say, you have, you could say, excuse me, can you help me? Right? And then usually somebody will say, yes, I can help you, or I will do my best. If they don't necessarily, you know, if they don't know what they need to help you with, they might not be, feel comfortable saying, yes, I can help you. So they might say something more like, oh, I will try. Or, you know, something along the lines of, I'll try, but you know, they don't want to give you a solid, yes, I will help you. I can help you. Because they don't want to say that and then be wrong. So, we have... Let's talk about basics when it comes to traveling, um, your bag will be called luggage, right? But for the purposes of it being claimed for you needing to go get it after you land, it will be baggage. Then the place that the planes land in and come into is an airport. And next week, I'm going to go into more vocabulary, uh, try to find some very basic words to help you to learn English, uh, mostly focusing on pronunciation of words and learning how to use those words in a sentence. But for now, I'm just kind of introducing you to a lot of the things that I hope that we can cover over the course of these videos. And maybe I will also get into some of the grammar part of things so that you can understand, maybe in your more advanced levels, how to read and write English properly so that you can get into, uh, if you're trying to get into a college here in the United States, right? Um... But please, you know, if you do want to come to the United States, please do your research, 
into the area that you want to go to if you want to go there. Um, if you have a specific area in mind. And if you don't have a specific area in mind, uh, if you can find some groups on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or anything like that, if you can find somewhere to go that might have some helpful resources and tips and stuff like that for the United States. I can tell you personally, don't travel to any cities if you can avoid it. Like, if you have a specific place in a city you want to go to, like a uh, Smithsonian Museum in Washington, D.C., or the Museum of Natural History in, I think Chicago has one where there's the Museum of Natural History, and that's where the uh, Lions of Sabo are. But if you have like a specific museum that you want to go see, or a specific artwork that you want to go see, that is only able to be found in a specific city in the United States, please make sure that you don't travel alone. Travel with people you trust. And if you are unable to have someone else join you, make friends with someone that's local in the country or someone that's in the country in general that might be willing to help you so you don't have to be alone on the trip. Um... And if you can, like I said, if you're not really set on going somewhere specific in a city, really, honestly, just avoid the cities. Go to national parks. Go to um, state parks in a state that you want to go to. Like if you want to check out, uh, if you want to check out Wyoming, they have the national parks of uh, Yellowstone National Park. One of the largest, you know, national parks in the world. And also the site to so many beautiful things. Um, you want to check out, you know, uh, Kentucky. There's the land between the lakes. Um, just so many places you can go and see that aren't necessarily in the city. And the cities are very dangerous places here in the United States. So I just, I'm just giving you some information, trying to help, uh, I'm not trying to discourage you from wanting to travel to the United States, but I am giving you caution and helping to hopefully point you in a direction that will be more, uh, useful and helpful to you later. So now let's talk about, uh, Let's talk about places in America and how to get there. So it will be very, the, the public, public transit system in the United States is not very well developed. Mostly because the country is so large and the cities can be so far apart that the public transit in the U.S., in order to do it, Sure, you might be able to do it for a city, but to do it outside of the city is going to cost more than you'll ever get back out of it. So they don't do it. You need to be able to get around. So once again, this is where having an American friend that you can trust if you're coming to America. Obviously, if you're going to any country that's a native English country because you're trying to learn English so that you can um, go to an English country, right? any country try to make friends with a native of the country that can help point you in directions even if you don't necessarily go to see that friend when you come to the uh country that you're going to right uh even if you don't actually go to see that friend because maybe you go to a different part of that country altogether then they can at least help point you in some directions for resources that might help you with your travels. Uh, so try to avoid any situation where you are completely alone and try to, uh, try to avoid anybody that might have followed you from any particular destination. Right? This is just
basic basic things not trying to make you afraid of coming to a country but trying to help you to stay safe right uh if you think someone is going to attack you please call for the police call for some sort of police intervention or police action uh if you are injured then you want to go to the hospital, right? Or tell someone to call me an ambulance, right? If you have a fire, and let's say for some reason there isn't a fire alarm where you're staying, then when or if you have to call 911, say, I need, uh, I need the fire department. Stuff like that. Basic stuff trying to give you some, you know, some basic conversational stuff, but also try to give you some basic, you know, ways to get help and ways to help yourself if you have a situation that you might need it, right? Uh, I was a little unprepared for this lesson, so it was kind of meandering, and I didn't really have a necessarily set lesson plan for today. I do apologize for that. Uh, I am more of an impromptu style of educator anyway. I like to kind of go with, go in the direction that seems right. But as far as teaching you conversational English goes, I will have to more strictly regiment that so that I can get a better grasp on giving you the necessary resources and also giving you the uh, comfort to speak in English and hopefully we can later on down the road if this channel starts to pick up momentum uh, I can have a viewer live stream or something like that on a alternative platform called locals or patreon or something like that that I can invite some of my supporters on and you guys can actually practice your English with me uh, I used to and sometimes still do teach English to native Japanese speakers. I do understand some basic Japanese and I am currently studying uh, Japanese reading and writing. Uh, I do understand some basic Spanish too. So if you are a native Spanish speaker, um, mi español es muy malo, uh, but I do, you know, so, uh, hablo español, uh, hablo un poco de español. But I, I'm comfortable with the pronunciation of the words and such in these two languages. I'm just not uh, fluent in these two languages, as I want to be anyway. Uh, I do know bits and pieces of a couple other languages, but... More so, I understand basic Japanese and Spanish. So, but like I said, at any point in time down the road, if this picks up, you know, steam and starts to garner some more support, then I hope that we can all have a chance to do some viewer live streams where you guys come on and, or call in on a number that I will have set up for that or on a different platform that I will have set up for that. And we can get together and we can all talk and you guys can practice, you know, your English. And you guys can ask me questions about anything you've got for English. Please, please, if you have something specific you want me to teach in any of my videos, please leave it in the comment section. I really, I'm trying to help you guys as well as, you know, letting you guys help me become a better teacher. I am trying to help you guys get better at English, math, and science, and any other topic that you want covered. I will be more than happy to help research so that we can all get better together and we can all kind of work towards a goal of better understanding of each other. That's, that's really what we should be striving for when we're learning, you know, conversational English um, and I'm learning Japanese and, and a little bit more need to practice Spanish, but really, um, 
when we're learning these languages, it, it should be about coming together, learning together, and being better together, right? Um, I will also be planning to do on um, an alternative platform called Rumble. I will be doing a fitness live stream, not expecting to get a lot of traction on that to begin with, but I'm hoping that you guys can help keep me honest by keeping me on the uh, right track with the fitness program. Please, if you guys have any, anything you want specifically covered, feel free to leave it in the comment section. Uh, I know that this lesson was kind of meandering, and I'm not sure many of you stayed until the end. But if you did stay till the end, thank you very much, and I really hope to see you guys in future installments of Better Together with Shinrai Sensei.